So, all right, let's get started. And I just saw a question on the chat about the slides. So the slides are posted uh, on the website. Um, all right. Okay, and here, yeah. slides don't move. Let's try again. Mm -hmm. All right, good. So for the moment, we are discussing about the query execution engine, um, the relevant chapter in the Ramakrishnan and Gerke book, that is chapter 12. And uh, we have started uh, already last time discussing different operator implementations for the standard operators, because uh, database management systems, they execute your queries by a sequence of steps where each of those steps uh, is one of the standard operators. And uh, for many of those uh, standard operators, such as filtering something or joining two tables, you actually have many alternative implementations for the same operation. And that enables the database management system to always choose the most efficient one. Now, in order to understand why those algorithms are defined the way they are defined, uh, we will discuss the algorithms and also we will think about how we can estimate the execution cost of those algorithms because then the algorithmic improvements that we will see over time uh, will actually make sense. All right, and as we have also discussed last time, we will generally measure cost by the number of uh, pages that are, writ, uh, that are read and uh, written to and from hard disk. All right. So those slides, uh, we have already started uh, discussing that uh, last time. We have started discussing about the filter operator. And uh, we have seen that there's multiple possibilities to access uh, the same table when uh, trying to retrieve the rows that satisfy a certain condition. We can scan, we can use binary search, or we can use indexes. And the last time, we have already looked at a little example for how we can uh, calculate the cost of a scan, which essentially just is the number of pages that we need to read from a relation. So here we have the numbers uh, from the example. And uh, on this slide, you also have more details about how you can get to those numbers in the example. All right, we have also discussed that uh, the cost for the output, for writing out the output of an operation is typically not counted because that is the same for all alternative implementations of the same operation. Um, we have also seen an example for binary search. Um, again, here you have the numbers and uh, here you have uh, the steps that we uh, did in order to get to those numbers. All right, <clears throat> now um, the next thing that I want to discuss about is uh, indexing and how we can use indexes for uh, evaluating filter conditions. So here we have always this query where we select enrollments uh, for which the course ID equals C is 4320. And on the upper half of the screen, you have a couple of uh, properties of the enrollment table and of the entire system. For instance, we know how many students and how many courses we have. We know that we have an average 10 enrollments per student and we have some information about the size of those different entries and about how many entries we can fit on one of those pages. Now here, since we deal with indexes, we also need some information about the index fan out, which means the number of uh, ch child nodes for each uh, index node. And here that is 100. So given that uh, we have uh, 100 entries per page, we have already calculated that before, and that the number of enrollment pages is uh, 6,000, um, think about how you would calculate the cost for using that index. So you have to think about how many inner nodes we have in the index that we need to visit, how many leaf nodes we have, and then what the total cost is. So here we assume that we are given a tree index and it's one of those tree indexes where the data is already integrated into the index itself. So you find directly the data in the index leaf nodes. So I give you um, 
like a minute or so to think about how you would uh, go about that. And uh, question on the index type in the hash, so this is a tree index. Right. So maybe you might not have had enough time for doing the calculations, but uh, perhaps at least enough time to think about how you would go about calculating this. Um, so this is the solution here. Um, we have um, a fan out of a 100. That means the index uh, root node has 100 child nodes. And uh, it has uh, 100 square, meaning 10,000 grandchildren. So that means that uh, we have only an index of height uh, three in total. And that means we only have to step over two inner nodes in the index before we reach one of the leaf nodes. And then for the leaf nodes, um, we just have to scan them in order to retrieve all result tuples. And uh, already in the previous calculations, we have seen that the results to this query fit on 60 pages. So the total cost is 62 pages. We also have those detailed calculations summarized uh, over here. All right. Now, last example on filtering. Uh, let's assume that we don't have one of those uh, indexes which integrate the data already, but let's assume that we have an unclustered index instead. So the entries in the index leaf nodes, they are not the actual data, but they point to the actual data, which means you have some additional overheads for uh, accessing the actual data. So here, if you look at the lower half of the screen, you have uh, the same number of inner nodes visited, the same number of leaf nodes read, but then additionally, we still need to uh, access the actual data. And uh, assuming that uh, those entries that we are looking for, we are looking for 6,000 entries in total, that they are located on different pages, it means that they have to read all those 6,000 pages from hard disk. And that makes access with that index actually quite expensive. Here you have, again, a summary of those uh, calculations. Now, altogether, we have seen different ways of answering the same query. We have seen that uh, scanning the entire table can be quite expensive. Uh, using binary search is already much cheaper. It requires, of course, that your data is sorted. Um, indexing, if the index is clustered and contains the data in the leaf nodes, that is uh, actually quite cheap, typically. Uh, using an unclustered index is typically more expensive and often it is even more expensive than scanning an entire table. And in this case, that actually happens. So using the untrusted index is a little bit more expensive at least than scanning the entire table. So even if you can use an index, it's not always a good idea to do that. You always have to calculate the cost of different options and then select the minimum one. All right. So uh, typically, it's not you doing this, but it is the query optimizer of the database system. Once it receives your query, then it uh, thinks about all the different ways in which it can answer it. It tries to estimate the cost of different possibilities and to compare them and to select the, the minimum one. But every once in a while, query optimization doesn't work out. And uh, then if you don't understand what's going on inside a database system, you will not, have, you will not be uh, capable of fixing it. So it's good to know what is going on in the background. Now in the following, I'm gonna show you a little example for different selection methods and how the query optimizer reasons about different ways of accessing the data. Let me quickly share my terminal. All right. 
Okay. And uh, so here for this example, I'm gonna use again the Stack Overflow Developer Survey table, which uh, contains results of this uh, developer survey uh, conducted by Stack Overflow. So we're gonna show you uh, some of the columns that the table contains. So each column corresponds to a different uh, question, essentially. All right. And uh, now, for instance, we had one um, column about the employment status. So perhaps at some point, I want to filter the entries in the table according to the employment status. And in order to make that fast, I might want to create an index on that column. So let's actually um, do that. So here we are creating an index on the employment column of the Stack Overflow table. That takes a few seconds and now we have the index. I'm enabling timing. Uh, okay. And now if I have, a, for instance, a query such as, I want to count the number of people that are retired, then um, probably internally the query optimizer might be using an index because it seems that this query is very fast. And uh, last time in one of the last lectures, we have compared the time with indexing and uh, without indexing. So without indexing, we had times of uh, typically uh, something around 100 milliseconds for queries on that table. So now here it is much faster. All right. Now, if I want to know more precisely what's going on internally, whether the query optimizer decided to use the index or not, um, you might want to try out the explain command. And the explain command essentially tells you how the query optimizer plans to answer a given query. So if I enter the same query as before, all right then the explain command tells me essentially the different steps in the plan that the query optimizer intends to execute. Now, what we have here, you see the keyword index in here. So it seems that the query optimizer decided indeed to use the index uh, over here with an index only scan. And uh, the final operation in that plan, which always uh, comes first when uh, representing those query plans in this format, that is an aggregation because I actually wanted to count those people. All right, so that is uh, how the query would be executed. So um, for instance, I mean, since here by default, I have created a tree index, I can also use that index for inequality predicates. So if I, for instance, replace the equal sign here by an inequality, um, then um, what, uh, would happen here is that uh, the query optimizer decides to use the index as well. Now, tell me in the chat what you think will happen now. If I replace this inequality uh, by an inequality into the other direction, do you think it will change anything? Can it even change anything? Anyone wants to make a guess? If I'm already asking about it, then probably something is going to change. So let's actually do that. Um, all right. And here actually nothing is going to change. Okay. Um, so it seems that uh, if I replace this inequality by the other direction, then it is still the cheapest uh, to use the index. <clears throat> but um, if I slightly <clears throat> change the query by adding, for instance, instead of counting the number of people who have a specific employment status, I'm rather, I rather want to select the specific respondent IDs 
of those people with a specific uh, employment status. <clears throat> and if I do this over here, then you see that the query optimizer has stopped using the index <clears throat> because it seems to think that not using the index is more efficient here. So the thing is this, the index that we are using here <clears throat> is by default an unclustered index. <clears throat> so it will point to the data instead of containing the actual data. And uh, as long as we use account aggregate, it means that we can only work with the index and count the number of entries that satisfy the predicate in the index. But as soon as I add different columns that are not directly a part of the index search key, we actually need to go through the leaf nodes in the index and retrieve the associated data uh, from the data table. And uh, doing that can be quite inefficient depending on how many entries you have to retrieve. So here with this inequality, I'm actually not using the index um, based on the query optimizer. If I replace it uh, by this one, then it suddenly starts using the index again. So the thing is that here, I am uh, using inequalities with the constant retired. So the letter R comes already pretty late in the alphabet. That means that probably less entries satisfy employment greater than retired than uh, entries satisfying employment smaller than retired. And that is why in one case, the query optimizer decides to use the index. In the other case, the query optimizer does not decide to use the index. And together with the plan that the query optimizer executes, you also always see the cost estimates for executing those different plans. Here you have uh, between parentheses the uh, cost estimates and estimates about how many rows will satisfy the condition that uh, you have in the query. So I mainly wanted to show you how you can get a sense for what's going on inside the database system, how the query optimizer decides to execute certain plans. You can get that with the explain statement. And as you see here, for multiple queries that are somewhat similar, because they use the same constant and the same table and the same type of condition, still for some of them, the query optimizer will decide to use an index. <clears throat> While for others, it will decide not to use the index and just to scan all the pages of the table instead. So the query optimizer essentially does this kind of reasoning that we are also doing by hand in order to um, understand how that is done. <clears throat> and here there's a great question about whether we can force the query optimizer to use the index. Um, well, Indirectly, yes, there's a couple of possibilities in Postgres to at least prevent the query optimizer from choosing certain operator implementations. So essentially you will force the query optimizer to use the index if you disable all other alternatives. So in a way, yes, there's a way to force the query optimizer. There's other database systems that offer your more diverse possibilities to influence what the query optimizer is doing, but it is possible. All right, now let's go back to the slides. So now you should see the slides again. And on this one, I'm essentially making the point that we always need to calculate the cost of different alternatives in order to select the optimum because it is a priori unclear what the best alternative is. Now, one last word on filtering. So far, we have considered cases where we have only one single predicate to answer. That is a little bit easier. In practice, you might sometimes have multiple predicates uh, within the same filter operation. 
So um, in those cases, what still always works, of course, is to just scan all the pages from the table and to evaluate those two predicates on each entry. You can also make a mix. You can, for instance, use the index in order to retrieve entries satisfying the first predicate. And then you evaluate the second predicate on those entries that you just retrieved. Or you could even, if we have two corresponding indexes for one index for each of the two predicates, then what you can do is you essentially retrieve the entries that match the first or second predicate from those two entries. And in the end, you merge them together and only keep the ones that appear in both indexes. So once you have multiple predicates, then you have more and more possible combinations if you also have indexes. When predicates become really complex, then typically in practice, the cheapest alternative is often to just scan the entire table and evaluate all of those predicates at once, but it depends on the particularities. All right, so those were a couple of different ways to do the filtering. Next, uh, we are going to discuss about join operators. And we will actually discuss a lot about different join operator implementations because that is in practice one of the most expensive operations in a query plan. And that is why there has been lots of research on different join operator implementations. And uh, people have developed a whole variety of alternatives. Some of them are more generic and you can apply them for arbitrary join conditions. Others have advantages because they are faster for certain types of join predicates. And uh, some are great because they need particularly uh, little main memory while executing. So there's a lot of different pros and cons and uh, your database management system typically supports many different join operator implementations. And then it chooses the best one at runtime. So the simplest uh, join operator that we will see in the following that is the page nested loop join. And the idea here is very intuitive. So you want to join two tables. Let's say I want to join the student table with the enrollments with the join condition that the student ID should be the same, okay? So the way the page nested loop join works is simply this. Um, I designate one of the two tables as the outer table. So let's say that is the student table. And uh, the other table, that's the so-called inner table. We will see why they are called that way in a second. All right, so I would proceed by loading one page from the outer table from the students from hard disk into main memory. And then I would iterate over the pages in the inner table, load one into main memory after the other one. So the new page always overrides the previous page. And uh, for all the tuples that I have in main memory, I will pairwise compare them, evaluate the join condition. And if it evaluates to true, then I add the corresponding tuple pair to the join output. All right, so that is pretty um, <clears throat> intuitive, but uh, let's see some uh, detailed code on this. So in the following pseudocode, I use the notations that you see here. We have a command for loading pages from hard disk into main memory. Um, we have a command pages of T in order to get the set of pages associated with a table T. And uh, the command tuples of P essentially retrieves the tuples which are stored on page P, assuming that this page has previously been loaded from hard disk into main memory. So we assume that at the beginning of execution of the join, all the data is located on hard disk because it doesn't entirely fit into main memory. <clears throat> now, let's say that we want to join the enrollment relation with the students relation. So in this example, we actually made the enrollment relation the outer relation and the students relation the uh, inner relation. Because as you see in the pseudocode, I have essentially two nested loops. And that is where the name from the algorithm comes from. And then the table that I'm iterating over in the outer loop, that is called the outer table. So what I'm doing here is uh, essentially I'm iterating over the pages of the enrollment table. For each of them, I'm loading the corresponding page into main memory. And uh, now I'm iterating over the pages 
from the student's table. And for each of them in the inner loop, I'm also loading it from hard disk into main memory. And then for all the tuples that are stored on the currently loaded enrollment page and on the currently loaded students page, I'm matching them pairwise when I'm evaluating the join condition, enrollment, student ID equals student, student ID for that tuple pair. And if it is satisfied, I'm adding it to the join result. So that is the page nested loop join algorithm. <clears throat> now in the following, let's analyze a little bit how we would calculate the cost of this operation uh, based on the number of pages in the enrollment and in the student relation. Now, this load operation over here in the outer loop, that is executed exactly once for each page in the enrollment table, right? Because we iterate over all of them and each one of them is loaded once. Now, if you look at this load operation in the inner loop, that one is executed more frequently because uh, here we are in the inner loop. That means we are iterating once for each page in E uh, in the outer loop. And in the inner loop, we are iterating over each page of the student's table. And therefore, this command here will be invoked uh, a number of times that corresponds to the product of the number of enrollment pages and the number of student pages, right? <clears throat> So here on the bottom of the screen, you see that I'm calculating the cost. I'm adding up the different uh, cost components. So I assume <clears throat> that I have some constant cost for loading pages from hard disk. And here I have counted the cost for executing that first loading command E times, pages in E times. And uh, now I'm counting the cost for the second load command over here. <clears throat> what I also might <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> what I also might want to count that is the cost for evaluating the join condition itself. So doing this doesn't require you to load data, but it has some computational cost. So here on the lowest row on the screen, I'm counting the predicate evaluation cost. And uh, query optimizers like the one from Postgres would take this loading cost and uh, this uh, evaluation cost into account. Now here in this course, we use a highly simplified cost model. You're only looking at the number of uh, data load operations. This is why in the following, we will neglect those cost components that uh, relate only to computational cost. All right. So this is the cost uh, of the page nested loop uh, join algorithm and it essentially just iterates in two nested loops over the pages of the two input uh, relations. Now we can also think about how much main memory that algorithm would need. So first of all, we need uh, enough space to store one page, the current page from the outer table. And on the other side, we need the space to store the current page from the inner table and uh, not directly shown in the pseudocode, but what you also want in practice, that is one buffer page in which you can store a uh, join result tuples. So in principle, you could imagine like writing uh, those join results directly to hard disk, but we know that uh, data movements become much more efficient if we move larger chunks of data between hard disk and main memory. This is why in practice we would reserve a buffer, an output buffer page in main memory in the buffer pool. And we write tuples into that page. Whenever it is full, we copy its content to hard disk in one operation and erase the buffer again so we can insert more result tuples. So altogether, what you need are those uh, three pages, which makes this algorithm quite main memory efficient. <clears throat> now, this is a little example here. Let's quickly move the chat a bit. So <clears throat> we have a thousand enrollment pages and a hundred student pages. So think a second about what the cost of the page nested loop join would be in this situation. And we assume that the enrollment uh, table is used as the outer table. 
Okay. All right, and here you have the solution. <clears throat> so if you simply, if you apply the cost formulas from the last slides, then uh, you essentially need to count the cost for reading the outer uh, table pages once that is associated with the first load operation. And then you need to count the number of loads for the second load operation in the inner loop. And essentially for each page in the outer table, you're reading all the pages of the inner table. And that means this is a thousand times the 100 pages. And in total, you get a relatively high cost compared to the join algorithms that we will see later of about 101,000 pages. Does anyone see an easy improvement uh, to this cost? Just a small one. Oh yes, very good. Here there's immediately the right answer in the chat. Exactly, so what we can do is to simply swap the order of the join operands because then I would replace this a term 1000 here by the term 100 because if I use the student table as outer relation, then I only need to count the cost for reading at the pages of that relation once. So here in this case, it doesn't make a lot of difference admittedly, but still it is a little improvement and all it takes you to do is to swap the order of the two join operands that make students the outer table instead. Okay. Now, this was the first uh, join operator. The question is how we, can we improve that operator further? Does anyone have any propositions about how we could improve this join operator further? Okay, very good. And that refers exactly to what we will see next. So here the suggestion is to essentially keep pages longer in main memory because it is true that uh, for some of those pages, we will keep uh, loading them and then erasing them and then loading them and erasing them. So we actually lo load the same page many times from hard disk during one single join operation and intuitively that seems inefficient. All right, so let's see how we can improve over that join operator by keeping things longer in main memory. Now that leads to the so-called block nested loop join. And the main improvement compared to the previous algorithm is essentially the following. In the previous algorithm, we have read the inner table once for each page from the outer relation. Now the block nested loop join instead reads the inner table once only for each block of pages from the outer relation. If it can fit that block of pages at the same time into main memory. And since one of those blocks contains multiple pages, doing this should be significantly more efficient than the page master loop join that we have just seen. So let's see what that looks like. And following, I'm gonna use those notations here in addition to the ones that we have seen previously. So here the notation page blocks uh, T comma B, that essentially is the set of blocks of pages from table T where each block contains B pages. And also in order to uh, mark the difference that I'm loading multiple pages instead of a single page, I'm also using load pages, the plural uh, for one block of pages. All right. So that is the block nested loop join. And uh, you immediately see that it is kind of uh, similar to the previous page nested loop join because here we also have two nested loops that iterate over both of the input tables. Still we are joining the enrollment table with the students table. And uh, now let's see uh, what actually changed. And uh, what changed is mainly what you have marked up in red here. Essentially, instead of iterating over single pages in the outer loop, 
the iterating over entire blocks of pages in the outer loop and then uh, correspondingly in the second line of the pseudocode use the load pages command for this entire block of pages. All right, now let's analyze how that changes the cost function. So this command over here, uh, actually nothing much changes. I still need to read the pages of the outer relation, the outer table once. And therefore I need to count the cost for uh, pages in the enrollment table times the loading cost. All right, now where the whole thing helps, this is for the second instruction here, because previously I had to invoke that for each page in students and for each page in enrollment. But now I have to only invoke that for each page in students and for each block of pages in the enrollment. And since the number of page blocks is smaller than the number of pages, I'm therefore saving a lot of processing costs depending on the block size. All right, so this is the entire the cost function and essentially the only thing that changes is that here we are uh, multiplying by the number of blocks instead of the number of pages. All right, and this is why that uh, factor also appears in the cost function below. So the trade-off here is that the page nested loop join needs extremely small amounts of main memory. It has a very small memory footprint, which is an advantage, but the block nested loop join is faster and uh, in exchange for that it consumes a little bit more main memory. We still need uh, one output buffer page like before. We also need uh, one page to store the current page from the inner table. Um, on the other side we need enough main memory to store an entire block of pages from the outer table. So this is what takes uh, most of the main memory when executing this join. And uh, you have a bit of a choice there because you can choose how large those page blocks should be. If you make them larger, you need more main memory. But on the other side, you might reduce the number of iterations of the inner loop of the algorithm. So here you can trade between time and between uh, processing uh, memory. So let's make a little example. Let's essentially make the same example as before, but this time we assume that we use a block nested loop join. So here we have a buffer size of 10 for the for storing outer blocks. I give you a second to think about how you would go about calculating the cost here while I'm looking at the chat to see whether there's any questions. Okay. All right, yes, and here there is a question about why we do not count the cost of writing something to hard disk. So that's a great question. So the only thing that would be written to hard disk potentially, that would be the result of the join. And uh, we have this convention that uh, when uh, calculating the cost for those uh, operations, we do not uh, consider the cost of writing out the result of the operation. Not, we don't write out the count the cost for writing out the final result of the operation. And the reason for that is simply that uh, when calculating cost, we always want to compare multiple alternative operations. And uh, since all of them are generating the same result, um, their cost for writing out the result will be the same. So that is why we do not count it because it would be constant for all the different alternatives anyway. And our main goal with those cost calculations is always to compare different uh, operations, different implementations for the same operator. So in practice, of course, you might have some cost associated with that, even if you are not considering it by convention. Of course, it depends also on um, the context of the operator. For instance, maybe um, you only want to count the number of uh, join results, but you don't actually want to produce the join results. In those cases, the output of the join would never be directly written to hard disk, but uh, it would only be counted. And in that case, you wouldn't have any output cost. So it depends a little bit on what next steps we want to take 
based on the joint output. And here we don't consider the output cost at all. All right, so let's have a look at the solution to the example. So um, what we have here is that essentially we still need to read the enrollment pages. So here we still consider enrollment as an outer table for consistency, uh, but then the number of times that we read the uh, student pages is uh, reduced. We have a block of size 10, and we have, um, we have a thousand um, pages. So we divide the 1000 by 10 and then we uh, multiply it by the number of pages in the students table, which is 100. So here we have reduced cost uh, compared to the page nested loop join uh, from something over 100,000 to 11,000. So roughly by factor 10. All right. Now, one final nested loop join variant that I want to discuss today, that is the indexer nested loop. And uh, we have already seen that indexes can be useful in order, to, um, in order to execute filter operations. We can also use them in the context of joins. And the main idea here is that I have uh, an index on the join column for one of the two tables that I'm joining. And I assume that the join condition is an equality predicate, which is the case in our example where we have an enrollment table and the students table, and we want to find a pairs of couples that match on the student ID. So student ID from enrollment equal to student ID from the students table. So therefore it is an equality join predicate. And now if I have an index, for instance, on the student ID, I can exploit that one during the join. And the main idea to do that is that I'm simply iterating over the pages of the non-index, the outer table. And uh, then for each entry on one of those pages, I use the index in order to retrieve the matching tuples from the other table. In order to make this work, I first of all need a join with an equality join condition. And also I need to have an index on the correct table and the correct column. Let's see in more detail uh, how that works like. And here, in addition to the notations from before, I'm also using the notation index of predicate, which essentially symbolizes an index lookup in order to retrieve all the entries satisfying the predicate in parentheses. And uh, here, I'm also using the notation tuple p comma i uh, in order to designate the tuple number i on page number p, because what I'm getting back from the index, that will be those uh, record IDs, uh, which as we have seen before, always consist of a page ID together with the corresponding slot number. Now this is how the algorithm uh, looks like. So uh, again, we are iterating over the pages of the enrollment table in the outer loop, and we load each of those pages. Then, for each tuple on the currently loaded page, we consult the index in order to retrieve matching tuples from the other table. So in this case, more concretely, we have one enrollment tuple um, and uh, that enrollment tuple contains a course ID and a student ID. And uh, I can use the index in order to uh, retrieve the entries in the student table with the corresponding student ID. And once I have found that, I load the corresponding page and then I add the tuple combination to the output. In the previous joins, we always had this if condition because I had to verify whether the join predicate holds. Now, if I'm using uh, the index here, then uh, I am essentially guaranteed that this uh, join condition is satisfied. So I don't even need to check anymore. I just add the tuple combination to the join result. All right. And uh, if I count the, the cost uh, for that uh, index over here, then uh, of course here again, I'm loading each page from the enrollment table once. And uh, also for each uh, indexed entry that uh, my index is returning to me, I need to load the corresponding page. Now, uh, the cost of that depends a little bit on where 
those index, how those index entries are distributed on hard disk. If you're very lucky, then those uh, entries are clustered together, or uh, at least approximately. And uh, that means that uh, since we have, are using the buffer manager, um, we can essentially uh, reuse previously loaded pages quite a lot of times. But in order to simplify the cost analysis, we typically make the assumption that uh, each page that we are uh, retrieving for an index result tuple, each of those pages is uh, located somewhere else and we have to load it for the first time. So uh, this is why typically we would just count the page loading cost times the number of entries returned by the index in order to get the access cost associated with the second load page command in the pseudocode. Of course, all of those cost formulas make simplifying assumptions as you see, but uh, nevertheless, um, they often allow you to at least make some rough estimates in order to uh, determine that one option is significantly better or significantly worse compared to a different option. Now, in terms of uh, main memory consumption, that algorithm is also uh, quite reasonable. We just need uh, one page to store the current page from the outer table and uh, then one page to store the current page from the inner table. And uh, furthermore, we need our uh, typical output buffer page. So altogether, three pages should be sufficient. Here, of course, I'm not uh, counting any storage for the index. The index would be typically uh, stored on hard disk. All right. So um, those are the join algorithms that I wanted to uh, discuss today. Um, perhaps you can already think a little bit about other things that we could exploit in order to make joins with equality conditions uh, more efficient. Or you can just uh, look at the next slides, uh, which are already online. Um, in the next lecture, we're going to discuss about a couple of more sophisticated join algorithms that uh, specifically apply for equality join predicates. Um, but uh, here, those index nested loop joins, they are very, vers like those nested loop joins in general, they are quite uh, versatile and they are uh, heavily used in uh, database management systems, also, for instance, in Postgres. All right. You see, there's like one question in the chat. I'm going to answer this one and then. Uh, all right. So here the question is uh, whether there's other join predicates than equality join predicates. That's a well justified question, frankly. So in practice, by far the most common join condition is indeed equality join conditions. And in most of the examples that we have seen here, if not all, we have used the join conditions, uh, equality join conditions. Now, in principle, you can also use uh, different join conditions. You can essentially use arbitrary join conditions. Um, and even if that happens less frequently in practice, every once in a while you have a join with non-equality join conditions. That is why it is very important for a database management system to uh, support some join operators which can deal with non-equality join conditions. And for instance, the page nested loop or the block nested loop join, they have that property that they can deal with arbitrary join conditions. Okay, good. Have a nice day. And then I see you again on Friday.